Hello, and welcome to the Collider.com podcast. I'm Collider.com senior editor Matt Goldberg, and with me is managing editor Adam Chitwood. Howdy, folks. And we're joined today by weekend contributing editor Ali Gemmo. Hey, guys. Today we'll be talking about the best movies of 2020 so far, and we'll be talking about theaters potentially reopening in July and why that's a bad idea. <laughs> but before we get to what the second half of movie going will look like, uh, in 2020, we want to talk about the first half of the year. We published a list on Collider a couple weeks ago called the best movies, uh, the best films of 2020 so far. And overall, what something that jumps out at me this year, the way things have been structured, like for me, the last major release was probably uh, like the last major successful release was The Invisible Man. And then because in March, everything kind of started drying up and studios started pulling their films. Like, I think if I recall correctly, A Quiet Place Part Two was pulled like two weeks before release. And so, you know, like the last movie to get like a serious theatrical release was like Bloodshot. Uh, So that's, and then, so since then, we've all been kind of in this world where it's like, we've all been turning attention to streaming and how and and using that and i think on the one hand that's kind of allowed these gems to surface to get people talking about them in a way that they may not have otherwise received attention and i think that's good um but i also feel like you know, in an alternate timeline we're talking about you know a quiet place part two or uh f9 or uh, Wonder Woman 1984, things like that. Like, so F9, what are you talking about? <laughs> oh, they titled a movie F9. They titled a not movie F9. I show respect to the Fast and Furious <laughs> franchise and their the a naming convention that is that is pretty much on par with the films themselves, unwieldy <laughs> and chaotic, <laughs> nonsensical. Got a lot. And it. yet kind of delightful. Yes. Yeah. So, I mean, looking at the at this list, um, I think one film and I didn't I didn't go I wasn't kind of over the moon about it. But a lot of people were uh, that I think has gotten more attention than it would have otherwise is The Vast of Night. Mm. Um, and I think like to me, that's kind of if we can look for any silver linings in all of this, uh, a film like that, which has no stars, is just kind of word of mouth. Um, thing can find an audience, and I think that's 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 good. That's kind of what we want from streaming, and I think it's harder to get that when there's so much content, and then especially when you're like a major studio can just buy up all the attention. Under normal circumstances, something like Wonder Woman would have bought up, you know, all these ad buys and trailers and TV spots, and you just you wouldn't be able to ignore it. Um, and that's fine. Like I think I've not nothing against Wonder Woman, but like the Vast of Night can now sort of you know poke its head out and say, hey. What watch our little weird movie? <laughs> yeah, exactly. yeah. It's like this tiny little indie that was shot like years ago, I think, and um, you know, finally got a release on Amazon this year. That was really interesting because it it felt like I don't know, and I don't know how you guys feel, but I've I kind of assumed going into this quarantine that I would be like any kind of little movie that was released, even if it was just new, I would be like, oh yeah, I'm gonna watch that. I want to watch new movies, but I found myself revisiting a lot of things and just kind of ignoring a lot of the kind of Netflix stuff that people are like, ah, eh, it's fine. Um, which I don't know. It made something like the vast of night really stick out for me because that was one of the new movies that I did, uh, was eager to check out. And I, um, was just kind of blown away by the, the craft and skill with which it was put together. Um, I just found it to be a really engaging, compelling, um, creepy little story. Yeah, I I mean, The Vast of Night is definitely a standout for me. It's probably like mid tier on my rankings of like my personal favorites of the year so far, um, just because there's a couple others nudging it out. But there's something very um, like Spielbergian about The Vast of Night, which is really fun and familiar. There's sort of a wide eyedness to it and sort of a nostalgia to it that's really easy to like cling on to, especially like I'm also in the can't like revisiting things right now rather than I'm using this time as catch up time rather than like diving into new stuff. Um, I mean, I'm seeing new things, but you know, this is catch up time. So like the, like coming to the vast of night through word of mouth buzz, but then actually diving in and seeing, it just feels very fresh. And um, 
like you said, Adam, there's a craft to it, which is, I mean, some of the camera work in that movie alone is like worth the watch. And that's something that I've recommended to like friends and family who aren't even that like technical into them. Like there's just something about the art of the movie, which is just as enticing as like the story, which is also great. I mean, the writing in that movie is also great too. So. Yeah, it's a, it's a fun little throwback. It feels like a, a film out of like the 40s or something. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's great that, that that a film like that can can find an audience. Um, although I will say, I don't, I think that film, because it's more like it's a little sci-fi, it's kind of like, it is like kind of a throwback. It does have that Amblin-esque tone yeah. to it. it. It makes it more accessible than something like, um, never rarely, sometimes always, which mm-hmm. we saw, which I saw at Sundance and it was never going to be an easy sell. It was originally original, was supposed to be released in theaters. Uh, Focus decided to release it straight to VOD. And on the one hand, it's like, oh, hopefully this can find an audience. But at the end of the day, it's, it's about two teenage girls from rural Pennsylvania traveling to New York City to procure an abortion. That's just not going to be a film that's going to that's going to be a crowd pleaser. And yet I do think it's right now one of the best films I've seen this year. And I'm kind of so on the other hand, it's sort of like there are always going to be even if you take away a lot of blockbuster competition, you still have um, it's still there are still films that are hard sells, if, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, especially right now, it seems like people are going for a more kind of comforting, comforting, Mm -hmm. which, again, I find curious that like something like Coffee and Kareem, which was released on Netflix and billed as this kind of like throwback, like buddy comedy. And it's got Ed Helms and Taraji P. Henson. And like, I I didn't hear like no one was talking about it. I don't know many people that saw it. And I just had no interest in seeing it. And yet we're starved for like new content. But it was still just kind of like, eh. See, and that's the thing. Like, Netflix is is shoving out, like, a lot of mediocrity. And I think the fact that, like, something extra, like Extraction got a little bit more attention, I think that's partially because Chris Hemsworth has some star power. It The, the set pieces are notable. I don't think they're great. <laughs> I think they're long. But I don't know <laughs> if I would, like, say, like, oh, I really remember the set pieces. But that, that was sort of their their calling card. But I feel like... Netflix, in terms of their narrative features, like right now, like the top of the heap that they've been able to offer in terms of popularity is Extraction, which I think speaks kind of poorly about the kind of films that Netflix is greenlighting outside of their, like Netflix has their prestige wing and like they'll release all of those at the end of the year and those movies will be great. Mm-hmm. But then other than that, it's like, here's Spencer Confidential. <laughs> and it's like, no one gives a fuck about Spencer mm-hmm. Confidential. And 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 even like I mean I thought the Lovebirds was okay like it was fine for what it was as a theatrical film that was dumped on Netflix, but for the most part I feel like Netflix as much as everyone's like go to streaming has Netflix really stepped up in any real way like I, I I'm I'm asking I don't think they've really you know mm-hmm. beyond I don't think they've they've really emphasized their brand. No, um, it's been really tough to get a sense of what um, Netflix's barometer is other than like just super thirsty for content in general. Like, there's a quality filter that needs to be applied to what's getting greenlit because like, I mean, even we, we um, you know, behind the scenes have been discussing like Netflix originals thus far in 2020 and I was scanning through the list and frankly it's just like what is going on um i do appreciate that netflix it has an international reach and there is like a nice mix of international you know like um, foreign language films making their way to um our shores and for people to take in but yeah coffee and cream whiffed and i'm sure like had the lovebirds maybe had um you know a valentine's day release or maybe like a release sometime around now, just the beginning of summer box office season, maybe it would have been good because the pull of Issa Rae right off Insecure and Kamal Nanjiani are, you know, pretty palpable. But yeah, whatever Netflix is aiming at, I'm not sure other than just wanting to scoop everything up with wild abandon. It's weird. It's it's strange because we're talking about Netflix and kind of whiffing and like the originals. And yet I would also argue they've released one of the best films, if not the best film of the year so far in Spike Lee's Defy Bloods, um, 
which is notable and striking. Uh, and I think it's been doing pretty well on like Netflix's top 10. But then you also look and like for weeks, the number one movie on Netflix was this Polish erotic drama called 365 DNI, which was, <laughs> <laughs> as I understand it, is essentially just porn. It's ba- guys, it's basically just um, like an hour and a half of like Pornhub like scenes with like some clothing involved. But like it's <laughs> it's bananas like. Yeah, there's a there's a very easy reason to see why now in like the fourth or fifth month of quarantine is where well some of it, I'm alone um flocking that <laughs> um yeah although interestingly like so the five bloods is of course like it's very easy to see in a sense why that would be shooting up to the top of the conversation and to you know the top of the hall because it is very clearly it's got the awards um shine about it and it and rightfully so it absolutely deserves every accolade it's getting right now um but i wonder if like in turn as we consider like what netflix is aiming for like is there something to be considered with like netflix is only worthy when we're pairing them with really good directors like or should we just consider netflix full out like a good place for original content i don't know that might be a little bit off. i mean i feel like i mean for me the business purpose of netflix is not to create good content or bad content okay. it's just to create content so that it can replace television that's sort of netflix's goal is right. to sort of become synonymous with your viewing habit so you know in the sense that like when someone says when someone says hey do you have a kleenex what they mean is tissue but because kleenex is the brand that you associate with this product mm-hmm. netflix would want to be that for all your viewing needs so for netflix it's like yeah we create some good stuff but we also create bad stuff it doesn't matter we'll just create and create and like we have to because as our licensing rights dry up, we have to do this. And while this isn't a TV podcast, I think you can sort of see the shortcomings of that when the fact that like Space Force doesn't exist anymore. Like Space Force was yeah. like, they they spent a lot of money. They like, if, maybe I'm wrong. Adam, I think they, didn't they drive like a dump truck of money to Greg they Daniels and Steve Carell to make this show? And like, it came out less than a month ago. I don't know anyone talking about it or cares about it or about it. And it was, and like they need it because they're going to lose the office. Um, and so like as Netflix also loses these shows that were, you know, you were binging on there that other people made Netflix is struggling to create their own kind of, you know, never stop watching us programming. And I think they're struggling there. Mm. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah, we I think we've talked previously about this kind of algorithmic algorithmic programming, not to get too far off topic. This is the best movies of 2020 so far conversation. Right. Um, but it does feel like a lot of uh, I was talking to Haley about this, like uh, she was talking about an upcoming show on Netflix that I don't think I can say the name of it yet. Um, that was just trash. And I was like, when was the last time like is Stranger Things the last time they had something that broke out in a way that was commercially and prestige um, successful? Like The Witcher uh, like broke out, but that show is has major flaws i don't think anyone would say like oh the winner is a you know a successor to game of thrones at the emmys um whereas stranger things is a major player at the emmys stranger things is uh, you know it's their big four quadrant hit it's this thing that took over the conversation it's the thing this thing that does win emmys that gets you know outstanding drama series nominations um but yet for all of netflix's uh um power it seems um they're having trouble like getting that. So Space Force is, I think, a good example of like they look and they know that they're losing the office, but they know that their viewers like Steve Carell. Their viewers also like Greg Daniels based on, you know, the other shows that he co-created. Therefore, you put those two people together, give them a lot of money and creative freedom and they go and make Space Force. Um, but, yeah, I don't know what we're what we're losing in the process, because uh, is with the five bloods, like they are giving these prestige filmmakers a lot of leeway. We I don't think we'd get Roma without Netflix. Probably mm-hmm. not going to get uh, Killers of the Flower Moon without Netflix. Um, cause well, so that's like, that's going to be on Apple TV. Oh, is that Apple? Oh, OK. Uh, I Which will be uh, fun, too, to see how Apple does when they wade in with that. Yeah, yeah. Um, but, yeah, I don't know. Film wise, like even this year, stuff like. Um, like the half of it I haven't seen yet. 
uh, like all the bright places. Some of them are more like YA or like rom com <clears throat> offerings. Feels like nothing's really broken out the way that set it up and to all the boys did. Even the to all the boys sequel like was okay. It was fine, but yeah. it wasn't necessarily one of the best films of the year. Yeah. And I think you know as we move further into this conversation, uh, Netflix is going to stand out for like maybe two films. Um, and yet they're supposed to be dominating this. Like this is supposed to be their moment where they're like, ah, oh, yeah, look at look at our power. Look at all the stuff we have. Right. And I mean, when you look at it, it's like now is our time to shine. That that to me is the conflict here, because even when you have good movies on a streaming service, like are people finding them and there's no real public data to know either way. So, for instance, two two films that uh, Allie, that you put on the list for Stargirl and Timmy Failure. And I've seen yeah. Timmy Failure and Timmy Failure is delightful, oh, um, you know, but like I don't know how many people ended up watching that film. Yeah, it's, you know, it's interesting as we kind of like ponder, you know, Netflix's viability. I'm thinking about how, like, what is the secret sauce happening at, say, Hulu, who um, is responsible on here on our list for being the platform for Shirley, which I loved. I fell in love with immediately. Um, It also helps. I've been a long time Josephine Decker fan. Um, But on the Latch Hive Unite. Um, But... You know, Hulu in particular is an interesting case study for me because their selection of films that they choose um, to bring to their platform is really interesting. I mean, they're home to Oscar winner Parasite right now. You know, they have prestige intrigue. Um, They also are home to a really interesting array. So Shirley is, of course, something um, that should be sought out if you haven't seen it yet. It's, I mean... The, Elizabeth Moss is very, very good in it as um, author Shirley Jackson. Um, this is kind of her year with Invisible Man as well. Um, she's doing some really interesting work. And, you know, but then we have things like Palm Springs to look forward to from Hulu as well, which is coming, which I know you guys both have been loving and have been um, avidly warding off, uh, you know, have been encouraging people to not, you know, watch the trailer if they don't want spoilers or anything. Um and I won't spoil it. I shan't. I shan't. Um, but, you know, where Netflix seems to um, hungrily scoop up, uh, seemingly, seemingly, I'm not privy to their their choices behind the scenes, but seemingly scoop up everything in sight. Um, yeah, streamers like Amazon and Hulu are making some really smart choices about what they want to get their platform to. And I think that's why movies like The Vast of Night and Shirley are in our conversations right now as well. On top of them being incredible movies as well, but they have, they on their own merit deserve to be in the conversation. But where they're where they're sitting at right now is also interesting. Yeah, I definitely think that the for speaking for Hulu, I mean their partnership with Neon has been a very smart move mm-hmm. because Neon is sort of a discerning distributor. Um, they go they they I think just they understand what's worth picking up and even films from them that weren't like major hits were still like critically acclaimed, like clemency, like clemency will hit Hulu later this month. And I'm excited to finally get a chance to see it, um, on Hulu. And so this, I think there, that, that helps when you have that line of prestige films, whereas Netflix is sort of like, it's everything. And then Amazon is sort of Amazon, I think doesn't really know what it wants to be right now. I think it was kind of, it was like on the prestige train. Like when it was like, promoting like Manchester by the sea and like it was kind of along those lines. And then they kind of said, okay, well let's try something else. So then they tried like, you know, Brittany runs a marathon and like, let's have fun movies and like, let's do the big sick. That was, that was both successful and, you know, it did get an Oscar nomination for best original screenplay, but Amazon is still kind of, I think feeling its way out in terms of what kind of content they want. But I think, they're helped by the fact that they don't assault you with it. Like there's not like a deluge of Amazon originals that you have to dig through every week. It's sort of like last week, 7,500 came out and that's a good movie. It's a good little thriller starring Joseph Gordon Levitt and it's worth your time. But like, I don't have to like say, you know, find this one among the 800 originals that they released just last week. And I think Netflix is kind of overdoing it. So the fact that it's, it's also, unless it's something they're actively promoting or like has a marquee name up to five bloods, it can be hard for something to rise to the top unless it is, you know, Polish pornography. (laughs) 
Well, I think I'm a big believer in uh, constraints bringing out the best in projects, I think, sometimes. I think there are some filmmakers like Wes Anderson who, like, you you don't need to give him constraints. Like, you can probably trust that if he has complete creative freedom, he's going to turn out something pretty spectacular. Um, But I think when you look at some of the Netflix movies, uh, their attitude may be, you know, well, someone will like it. Like, you know, it doesn't have to be this or that. But if you look at some of the other movies on our list that are some of the best films of the year, they are studio pictures. Like The Invisible Man was made with Universal Pictures. And, uh, you know, Lee Whannell, uh, I'm sure, didn't have complete carte blanche in making that movie. Like, he definitely was given creative freedom to make it unique. But you're also trying to make something that has to make money and something that has to please what the studio thinks. Um, and it's Blumhouse, so it has to cost like five million dollars or less. Yeah, so there's those yeah. constraints. Even something like Emma, which is focused features, which I think is absolutely one of the best films of the year. Um, <laughs> I think what what movies like this have in common, or or like Onward, which is a Pixar movie, like these movies are made for traditional studios. Um, King of Staten Island is another good example, I think. Like you are making something with an established film studio that is going to have its own set of parameters. You're going to have executives. You're going to have notes. I think sometimes those uh, can make movies very bad. But I also think there's a reason that that the theatrical model still stands, which is that like some of, by and large, the best films of the year are not being made by streamers. They're being made by traditional studios. Um and we do know that at Netflix, you were given an, uh, a pretty insane amount of creative freedom. And I think The Irishman and Roma, I think, are you know, more exceptions than the rules. And I don't pretend to know what kind of conversations go into when you're making something like um, All the Bright Places or uh, To All the Boys I've Loved Before, although To All the Boys was an acquisition. Um, but even at, at Hulu, like Shirley was an acquisition. Hulu didn't create that movie. Uh, Palm Springs is an acquisition that was made by an independent studio. Um, so I don't know. I think there's there's something to be said for films being made traditionally rather than just throwing a bunch of money at their creators and like letting them have everything they think they need at their disposal to make the movie that they want because sometimes those constraints can create um a better tighter you know more compelling film yeah i mean the 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 creative process that traditional studios work through i mean if there's a double-edged sword of gatekeepers basically and that double-edged sword like you know on the negative side it does limit voices and i think it's important to push for like you know uh black indigenous people of color for those filmmakers to have a voice that traditionally doesn't get heard in Hollywood um, for LGBTQ plus, you know, for them to have a voice in Hollywood. That's for the downside of the gatekeeper. But the plus side is that, you know, gatekeepers help you from getting overrun because on Netflix, you get overrun. Like you, there's just so much stuff that you don't, it's hard to know where to start. And like, we try to provide a service on Collider with like, these are the best movies on Netflix or these are the best action films on Netflix. Like trying to guide people in a way that I don't think Netflix Netflix is very proud of their algorithm. I think their algorithm kind of sucks. Um, but that that at least provides some sort of guidance because I think Netflix is just overwhelming people. Um, and again, in a time when they should be standing out, people are just kind of instead moving to what's familiar because the newer stuff is just there's too much of it and a lot of it's kind of mediocre. I mean, it's really hard to compete when you put Walk Hard on Netflix. Like, how do you watch anything else? No, absolutely. It's a a masterpiece. (laughs) Um, The wrong kid, Dad! (laughs) I like when he comes back and is just in the bar and work, and he's like, the wrong kid, Dad. (laughs) He's just singing singing his song. Uh, That's all right. Wow, what a throw. Um, You know, I'm also sitting here thinking, too, about, like, in a slight divergence but um thinking about this uh the benefit of going to like a prominent streaming platform like i think it's interesting and and returning to like the idea of harder cells like we have a couple movies on here that like are smaller slightly harder cells i'm thinking of not just never rarely sometimes always try saying that five times fast um but also like swallow which is also really good um but is could could in a in another timeline be flying under the radar like i think it's really great that we um that there are opportunities uh to see that now and to like give your attention to it in like 
not rushing out to see Black Widow. I think, you know, when it comes to a female-led story about, you know, autonomy and, you know, choosing your place in the world and figuring out your relationship to, say, controlling men, you know, uh, Swallow is just as good, um, if not better than, you know, some of the other things out there. And, like, I just think that that's really interesting, too, that we have this lull in the deluge of big titles and smaller things like those two titles that I've mentioned can come through. And I think that that's going to be one of the really unique things that we remember when looking back, not only at our picks for the best movies overall, when we do eventually finish this list, but also this movie going year in general. And um, that's not at all to say like, Thank goodness for a global pandemic. I'm not even going to go there and say that because um, that's not the case. But um, I think it's perhaps an interesting way to reset the way we um, assess what movies to give our attention to and how we give our attention and dollars to them. Absolutely. And I think that's a good sort of jumping off point to talk about, you know, what comes next and talk about, you know, the potential reopening of theaters. So. Uh, next month, July, uh, theaters are planning to reopen. And there was, at, at first, there was no plan for any mask policy in place and from the three major chains, which, chains, which would be Cinemark, Regal, and AMC. Um, after outcry, uh, AMC and Regal have decided to institute a mask policy. However, I'm still dubious about how well will that mask policy be enforced and are they still selling concessions? Because if you're selling concessions, you're not really enforcing the mask policy because you have to remove the mask to eat and drink and what have you. And Alamo Draft House is like, we are enforcing a mask policy except for eating and drinking. I'm like, well, that's not a mask policy, is it? But the, 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 the bind that these theaters find themselves in is that cinemas make most of their money from concession sales, whereas ticket sales, they spend. Uh, largely those that revenue goes to the studios and the production companies. Uh, the concession sales and why those are always so expensive is that's money straight into the theater, the exhibitor's pocket. Mm. Um, so if you take away concession sales because you have to institute a mask policy, what good is reopening? Because again, this is all, you know, these theaters are reopening because if they don't reopen now, their fear is that they will never reopen. That by virtue of paying rent, on their properties or the leases or whatever, all the overhead that that is ongoing, regard even though they're not pulling in any revenue, um, all of that will eventually sink them. Uh, it's sort of a slow kind of death, uh, not generating any revenue. But if they don't have concessions, they're still not generating any generating revenue, even if they are technically open and showing movies. They're not generating enough revenue. So as we come to July. Uh, right now, it's looking like um, just today there was the Broken Hearts Gallery, which is saying it's going to open on July 10th. Uh, then you have uh, Mulan is supposed to open on July 24th. I think Mulan is going to move just because Disney has not been marketing it at all. Yeah. <laughs> it's so quiet. It's been very quiet. The film, but Tenet might hold to that July 31st date. Uh, mm. And Tenet is sort of being seen as this, you know, if what's going to bring people back to theaters. And I just feel like it's just not a good idea to go to a movie theater right now. Regardless, like you, if the best movie ever was released in theaters, it wouldn't be a good idea to sit in theaters right now. It's these theaters are a petri dish. We know what do we know about the virus? We know that. Not everyone is wearing masks, even though they should be. We know that the virus spreads in small contained areas when you're sit that over a long period of time, like let's say a couple of hours where you're just sitting there in an enclosed room. It's it's a high risk area. And this notion that like, well, we've got to bring back movies. Unfortunately, I mean, I don't want to see theatrical exhibition die. I love going to the movies. I love theaters this is a bad hand like but like but the the solution is to sacrifice the customer uh mm -hmm. for the benefit of the theater like it's at the end of the day it's not you know the the ceo of amc absorbing this risk he's not the one who's who's risking it it's it's all of his customers and that's where i i really take umbrage with this whole reopening plan 
fan. It's not that like, oh, I hate movies and I don't want to see Tenet. Um, I don't want people to get sick and die. That's that's my concern here. Yeah, it's kind of, and I've said this before in our like one-on-one conversations and whatnot, but it's also like so all of this can in, in combined with it's a big ask for you know your standard American family for to drop in the neighborhood of what 50 60 70 dollars on tickets and concessions and whatnot um money that needs to probably be saved for other things um since that's you know a precious commodity anyway but right now it is too um to go and sit and hope everyone keeps their masks on and and all of these things i don't know like from a from a consumer standpoint like what what the attraction is um and i'm sure you know yeah seeing seeing a christopher nolan film is always fun and especially in the theater but yeah do i want to be super conscious of like a mask on my face as i try and process whatever john david washington and robert pattinson are doing in all of their glory version yeah not time travel time inversion <laughs> time inversion um, you're catching the bullet. Okay, cool. Cool, Clemens Posey. Um, but, you know, I can't see that being, like, the summer thrill that I want. Like, I'm gonna, yeah, get around to watching Wildcard or something, you know? Like, I, I it's crazy. Yeah. Oh, I can see a scenario. The cynic in me is, like, I can see AMC or Regal being, like, <laughs> Did you forget your mask at home? Did you forget your hand sanitizer? Well, for an extra ten ninety nine, buy our, you know, sanitize easy package or something with like a mask and all these things, which is very dystopian and very awful and very weird. But, um, you know, I can see them maybe monetizing like off concessions losses in other ways. But I don't know. It just sounds so tiring to go to a movie theater right now. It just sounds like such a Herculean effort. I mean, I th- well, go ahead, Adam. Well, I was going to say, I think it's tough. I think, I mean, if you think about it in terms of like operational costs, I don't know how they don't open because the summer movie season, I, in terms of their projections of what they make every year, the summer movie season is where they make the most of their money. And this year, those projections are off. And we have seen through this pandemic that as much as politicians want to tell us like, well, you should have had money in the savings account, that these corporations do not have savings accounts. They are immediately furloughing staff because they do not have anything left over if they have to shut down their doors for a month. Uh, And movie theaters have now been closed for what five, it'll be five months, four or five months. So they closed in March. Yeah. So about four months. Um, And Matt, you made the point in your editorial, like in a perfect system, the U.S. government would shore up those theaters so that they could survive, so that we could stay, keep them safely closed so that we could all stay safe. Um, But I also don't know if this industry survives if they don't open. But I don't want to go to a theater and get sick. So it's this it's this catch 22. But we've also seen as states have started to open, like people are going out. They're going out to eat. They're going to, you know, uh. I don't know, bars, they're doing whatever willy nilly without masks on. So I think cynically, the theater chains are like, well, yeah, the people are going to come. And yeah, we're gonna exactly. Yeah. Well, and that's the thing, like people will show up. Like, I, I mean, I yesterday, I my wife and I went to go pick up um, some takeout for Chili's for Father's Day. And like in the window, there are just people just sitting down inside the Chili's, like going to have a meal at Chili's. I'm like, is that worth risking your health? Like I need to eat in this Chili's, <laughs> so, and so the fact that like people are going to do that means they're definitely going to go see Tenant. Like I have no doubt, like people will go see Tenant. I don't know as many people are going to see it as Warner Brothers would like. I think that that's the calculation they're 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 trying to figure out. It's not that no one will go see Tenant. It's that well, okay, if we release Tenant now, it'll make fifty million on opening weekend. But if we released it in a safer time, it would make a hundred million. So you know, what's the calculus? here so what like how how but either way it's the consumer absorbing the risk here Mm -hmm. and i mean i guess if people want to be like risk gamble their health for a movie that's their prerogative 
I wouldn't recommend it. Like, and I, I'm saying that as someone who will probably have to go see these movies as my, like, as part of my job. Like, I will have to, like, go into the theater with, like, 20 other critics and, like, we'll sit far apart and we'll all be wearing masks. It'll be the ideal conditions. Mm -hmm. But I get to see those in ideal conditions. You don't get to see those in ideal conditions. You have to go see it with people who may not really care to wear a mask. I mean, I think we have all figured out by now that theaters are not exactly hotbeds of considerate human beings who care about their fellow theater goers. So this notion that like, oh, well, I'm sure they'll all wear masks. Come on. So I, I feel like it's just the risk is too high and, and nothing is mitigating it. Yeah. I, well, and I was going to say, too, like. We keep going tenant, tenant, tenant. We keep coming back to this. But like it brings me to like thinking like. What's actually going to be on offer is pretty grim as well. Like, I understand, like, Christopher Nolan is an appealing uh, filmmaker and what he makes are great big box office draws. But, like, Nolan is not everyone's cup of tea. Nolan is not going to appeal to families who want to get out with their kids under, you know, 15 or whatever. Um, and when you think that you also have, you have Broken Hearts Gallery, which looks very cute but does not... Uh, immediately strike me as um, being the great big competitor against Tenet. Um, you also have Unhinged, uh, the Russell Crowe like road rage movie, which again applies to a very specific demo. Um, I I don't know that couples are going to yearn to see Russell Crowe target a, a young mother on um, a road rage movie. Like it just and what what else do we have? I just I thought, mean thought, Antebellum oh, arrives in August supposedly. Hopefully, I mean, that could be good. I can see that having get out levels of word of mouth buzz and draw and um, being a conversation starter where we could, you know, urge one another to consider it strongly. But com combined with like what's being offered with, you know, everything else, it feels, yeah, like too big an ask. I just don't know. <laughs> Because you look at like a, a restaurant, you're in there for what, 30, to 30 minutes to an hour, but a movie theater, again, with concessions, again, you can't enforce a mask policy if people are eating the concessions, and they're going to make um, exceptions to people eating. Um, but that's the way it spreads. Like You can hand sanitize the chairs all you want, but the, the way that we know from science, from the CDC, that it spreads, it's droplets through your, your breathing and coughing and you know laughing. Like God forbid they release a comedy. Um, I guess that's one thing we don't have to worry about with Tenet is that Chris Nolan movies are not very funny. So, mm. um, but like it, You did you know, it, Chris. A, you killed laughter. <laughs> being in that enclosed space with everyone gosh i just don't know I, and with the social distancing like how like what capacity are they going to have but again as we talked about i don't know if we talked about it on or off air last time um like it's still a month away and as you've seen in 2020 a month is like seven years in in actual real world time so i have no idea what the world looks like a month from now but it's hard to believe the the pandemic will just be over or that things are done. But it will be an additional month that we've been living in an America that is largely open to the public. Because I think New York and L.A. both opened pretty significantly last week. Um, they're kind of final phases and final barriers. So, you know, do we do they shut everything down again? If you find out that someone at the AMC at, at whatever in Atlanta had coronavirus, do they test and trace do they say like oh okay well we're going to shut down that auditorium but does that work because the air conditioning goes throughout the entire building how right. many showings were after it like how do you track that well and the thing is is i think there's consciously is no there consciously is no tracking We've, yeah. we have no test and trace program so whereas in china where they do have a test and taste trace program they tried reopening theaters and then they quickly shut them down again because they found out oh yeah COVID-19 is here and we can trace it back to this theater. And in America, it's kind of a see no evil, hear no evil, speak no evil policy. So if you get COVID, who knows where you got it from? It could be anywhere. Come yeah. see Tenet. And wasn't it like it, China shut down again because something like three or five people tested positive? Like, what a dream scenario. I'd love to have that kind of vigilance here where just a swift shutdown, the first brush of danger. But... Who knows? And nope. the, yeah, it's <laughs> America. Anyway, it's well, I really want to see Tenet. Like, I really want to see Tenet. Yeah. I'm very much looking forward to this movie. I don't want it to sound like we're here saying like, oh, you know, whatever. Like, I am 
not dying, but I am extremely eager to go back to the movies. Like I want to go back to the movies. I miss it very much. And it's not the same, just like watching stuff at home. Like I enjoy watching stuff at home, but I very much miss going back to the movies, but it's, it's not worth risking the health of myself, the health of my family, the health of my friends. Yeah. Yeah. Well, with that, uh, (laughs) uh, I did have a question for both of you before we move on. Um, because this is ostensibly about the best films of the year, I wanted uh, to see if each of you would. Uh, what What is your favorite movie of the year so far? Okay. What's your number one? Ali, what about you? I've got to go to Five Bloods. I just keep coming back to that. Uh, Delroy Lindo's performance is uh, so far the best of the year, um, and this is very clearly for me an award season front runner. This and uh, specifically with Lindo's performance for best actor and for best picture. Um, yeah, it's just so good. And you can see it for free at home. I mean, it's a treat. It's a must see. Uh, yeah, for me, it'd probably go with never rarely sometimes always. Cause that film just left me shaken after I saw it at Sundance. And I think that, yeah, it's not an easy film by any stretch, but I feel like it's a, it's an essential film uh, for what it's trying to explore and, the way it does it with a lot of earnestness and humanity. Um, I think it's just, just a really powerful story. And I hope that, uh, that people eventually seek it out. Mm. Have you guys seen Artemis Fowl? <laughs> oh, I forgot about Artemis Fowl. Okay. <laughs> Jill, stop. Again, I forget. <laughs> um, the day I, I see Artemis stop. Fowl, you'll know I've seen Artemis Fowl. That's all I can say. You'll pick up. You'll pick up Vinnie Mancuso's Top of the Morning. Yeah. <laughs> Either that, or I'll be calling in sick because I've just seen too much dirt eating for my lifetime. I don't know. <laughs> but wait, Adam, what about you? Where Where do you stand? Where's your like favorite favorite? Uh, it's probably Defy Bloods, even though like it's an imperfect film, but it's the one I can't stop thinking about. Mm-hmm. Um. But I liked Invisible Man a lot as well. But I've, uh, specific moments from that movie have been reverberating in my head ever since I saw it. But I will say, and I've seen it once, and it could have been, you know, um, festival hype or whatever. But once Palm Springs comes out, that may be my number one. Because that's, I think that was my favorite movie that I saw. It's on this this year. It's yeah, awesome. looking forward it's, to that. And it's perfect for now, because it's just a delightful romantic comedy with a twist. Um, yeah. That's just yeah. so much fun. Well, cool. Well, uh, let's move on then to to recently watched. Uh, Ali, what have you seen lately that you want to talk about? So I treated myself accidentally um, to a Ruben Fleischer, Jesse Eisenberg uh, double bill. Um, It was ill-advised in the end because it started out with revisiting 30 minutes or less and ended with a first time watch of Zombie Double Tap. Um. The first has not aged well, and the second will never age well. Um, So it was interesting. Uh, It was nice to see the kookier side of Jesse Eisenberg and be like, oh, yeah, that's cool. Um, Yeah, a really interesting way to spend a Saturday night. Um, Not one I'm eager to repeat, but it's good to be reminded of what's, you know, out there. The aggressive mediocrity of (laughs) Ruben Fleischer. I remember like Zombieland was this massive hit and then he just did 30 minutes or less next as like just another really small comedy movie because I think he was being offered some big stuff. Yeah. yeah. And then he did Gangster Squad. Gangster Squad. <laughs> was Venom right after that? Did Venom come in after that or no? Then he did a bunch of TV stuff. Mm. Um, yeah. And then he did and then he did eventually and then come Venom. Back with Venom. So yeah. yeah. And then to luck out with an Oscar with a couple, what, a couple Oscar nominees and a sequel 10 years later. Yeah. Just perfect. <laughs> perfect study. Yeah. yeah. So that's me. Uh, Adam, what about you? What have you seen lately? Um, so I knew it was firing off of Netflix soon. So it, it had been on my list to watch um, before the end of June. And then I saw on Letterboxd that you had watched Mask of Zorro and were raving about it. And I was like, all right, we're watching Mask of Zorro Saturday night. And we did, and it's just so good. It's so good. It came out in 1998, and I remembered it being like super fun and uh, really enjoyable, and I had seen it a number of times. 
but like it's just kind of the perfect adventure movie like it's uh it's swashbuckling and fun and flirty um i really like the conceit that you have like the old zoro handing off to the young zoro but it doesn't feel uh like contrived like i think anthony hopkins is really good in the in the film i think antonio banderas is also really good uh catherine zeta jones um James Horner's score is incredible in that film, um, but also just the tactile quality of it. Like the the action that happens in the movie is like sword fighting and um, sword fighting like with purpose. Like you feel the fighting through the characters as opposed to, and you know, as much as I like certain Marvel movies, they devolve into an animated film uh, in the third act almost always. Um, especially now when they can do facial replacement. Like it's just that's just animators. Like there is no actual human being doing any of that um so it's nice to see like these human beings like fighting and uh in just a really fun um adventurous way i think it leaves on the 31st of june so if if you haven't seen mask of zorro you haven't seen it the, the 30th of june adam 30th oh yeah there are only 30 days in this month yeah, is it not april are we not still in april um, which also has 30 days yeah uh, <laughs> Oh, so man. I would highly suggest checking out Mask of Zorro again. I haven't seen the sequel in a long time. I don't remember it. it I don't remember loving it as much as I did the first one. Yeah, the, the, issue, see, with Leg- the, the issue with Legend of Zorro is it's not like a terrible film. It has a kid. And when you have a kid, like, they, like it, it ticks up, it picks up in kind of real time after, like, you know, seven years, like the film came out seven years after the original. And now they have like a seven year old kid. And when you're worrying about the kid, like the kid is sort of like doing st- like, and it's just, I don't, it's always hard when you add a kid to the equation. Um, yeah. That's why like, like the mummy returns is not as fun as the mummy because there's a kid and yeah. it's just, it, 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 it makes, it, it kind of throws off the, the formula. You hear that, filmmakers? No kids. Never. No kids. Or no kids anymore. No, unless you're, Actually, unless you're no changing. kids or only kids. Like, if you have, like, the Goonies, like, it can be only kids or, like, only adults. But when you put okay. them together, then the adult has a responsibility to the kid. And it's, like, unless it, – like, there are times when it kind of works, like, you know, Temple of Doom. But yeah. it's it's rare. So, But I'm glad you enjoyed your rewatch of Ask of Zorro because that movie is amazing. Yeah. That's also just like the most glorious '90s leading cast ever. I just Banderas, Hopkins, and Zeta Jones. You gotta love it. Yeah. Uh, for me, my wife introduced me to a film I hadn't seen before. I'd heard about as uh, Vera Drake, starring Imelda Staunton, as Mike Lee's 2004 film. She was nominated for Best Actress. And going into it, I'm like, oh, okay, I know it's about this woman who performs abortions. People are going to watch this, and like, between Never, Rarely, Sometimes, Always, and Vera Drake, Matt apparently only watches abortion movies. That's a very particular niche that he is he is diving into. Um, no, but the thing that jumped out at me, so Vera Drake takes place in, the, in 1950, and, and she is a woman that performs abortions, but they're not like, there's not like coat hangers or anything like that. It's just she... There's a procedure. She and, and she doesn't take money for it. She just sees it as helping out women of all different sort of social classes who need this help. You know, sometimes it's a woman who's been out on the town. Sometimes it's sort of a scared immigrant. Sometimes it's uh, a woman who is has an abusive uh, partner. Or a woman who has too many kids, who has like seven kids and does not want an eighth child. Um, and so she's performing this service. And what really jumped out at me watching the film is that it's not really about abortion as much as it's about class. Uh, Because there's a subplot that barely intersects narratively with Vera Drake's. It involves Sally Hawkins as a wealthy woman who needs an abortion. And what Mike Lee is sort of getting at is that it's not really, it's about class. That's the story he's trying to tell. And like what the working class is allowed to do as opposed to what the upper class has the freedom to do. And it's a really interesting dichotomy that he paints there uh, through this uh, action, through, you know, her her doing these abortions, which again is not, you know, she's not rendered as this political figure or anything like that. She sees it as a service, a way to help people, um, to help young women who are in trouble, uh, which is how they describe it. They've gotten themselves in trouble. Um, and I think it's just, it's a really... The way I think Mike Lee has a lot of 
affection and compassion for these characters and the realities that they're going through. Uh, but I think sort of pulling back a little and and making having the awareness of class really gave it its own personality. And I was really moved by it. Uh, so the film is currently on Criterion Channel if you want to check it out, uh, Vera Drake. Nice. Uh, okay, well, thank you all so much for uh, watching and listening to this podcast. If you want to keep up with this podcast, you should follow us on Twitter. Allie, where can people find you on Twitter? Um, I am at underscore matinee idol, M-A-T-I-N-E-E-I-D-L-E, all in word. And Adam, where can people find you? At Adam Chitwood. You can find me at Matt Goldberg. Thanks for listening, everyone. We'll be back with you next week. Thank you.